Welcome everyone. Today we have with us a guest on our show. We have Jay Burr from Zlapo. He is the founder of Zlapo, the best Twitter automation software out there at the moment, the one I use, and that, that's helped me grow from 200k to 300k very fast. So Jay, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. So tell us a bit about Zlapo. What made you start it? What does it do? Okay. So Zlapo was actually born out of my own uh, pain. So what I realized uh, when I was trying to like uh, grow my Twitter account was I was doing a lot of things manually. So for example, I've written a lot of good tweets, a lot of good threads that I'm manually always having to dig up the retweet manually so that uh, my new followers could actually uh, see some of my best performing content from the past. And I realized it was becoming very tedious. So what I did was I started studying the Twitter API to see if I could automate this. And I did automate this uh, with a Python script. This was back in 2019 um, and the late 2019. And that was when I had the idea of, you know what, why don't I just turn this into a full-blown SaaS to see if anyone else has the same pain point as I did. Um, and from there, I uh, started a MVP, a minimum viable product. I put it out there. And then uh, the first thing that my users immediately requested was scheduling. So I added scheduling. So the MVP uh, literally only had auto retweeting and scheduling. So that's how it all started. And uh, that's uh, from there, it's really just user feedback to build up on uh, what we have initially. Interesting. So it was essentially you needed the software first, then you built it, then people liked it, and then you kind of kept building on it. Yes. Interesting. That's very good. So is this your first company? Give us a bit of your background. Where did you learn how to code? Is there, Do you have a computer science degree? How did this come to be? Okay. So I'll, I'll just give you a very brief background. Um, so back when I was little, my parents were kind of overprotective. So they kind of, um, so the internet was big in the in the mid to the late 90s. Uh, but we didn't have a computer at home until 2000 because my mom wanted to uh, shield us from all the uh, strange danger, pornography, you know, whatnot on the internet. So when, when we finally had uh, a computer at home, um, I wanted to play catch up because uh, my friends were talking about things I had no idea about. They were talking about GeoCities. They were talking about Neopets. They were talking about uh, what? Command and Conquer Red Alert. I had no idea what those things were, you know? So when I was 12 and 13, I had this very strong motivation to just sort of play catch up and learn everything there is to know about, uh, like, you know, designing images, making websites, uh, coding, uh, even making animation. So. When I was a young teenager, I actually uh, started learning coding on my own. I didn't actually monetize it. I didn't make. I didn't try to make money out of it because um, there was no need to back then. And then uh, when I moved on to college, um, all three years of college, when I was in college, I actually put the built on my skills uh, because I was studying law in college, and I didn't really enjoy it. Actually, I really didn't enjoy it. Uh, so I decided, you know what, I have to rescue myself from this predicament. Uh, I have to have an alternative career path if I didn't want to utilize my law degree and, you know, become a lawyer. So I decided, you know what, I'm pretty good at coding. Um, why not expand on the skills that I already have? So when I was a teenager, all I did was a lot of JavaScript, um, HTML, I played with some CSS. I did something called ActionScript, which is sort of obsolete right now. But it doesn't matter. It provided me like a very solid uh, kind of grounding. So when I was in college, uh, I learned PHP, I learned uh, C, I learned Python, and uh, I sort of just built onto that. And I actually worked as a freelance developer for three years of college. And while I was in college, I founded my first startup. Um, it was called Zuki. Um, it was actually a Shopify for Groupon clones, if that makes sense. So basically, we created a platform for anyone who wanted to write uh, the Groupon way. So group buying and daily views was a huge deal uh, in 2011 and 2012. So we created a SaaS for that, my friend and I. Um, and uh, yeah, we did pretty well in that startup. So 
Zlapo right now uh, was actually, like I said, I told you, was founded. The idea came to me in late 2019. And um, yeah, it's my second startup. Hmm, interesting. So when you say you learned JavaScript and all the languages back in college, were you officially studying like computer science or some sort of degree related to programming or what were you studying? No. Um, so I, I'm completely self-taught in programming. Um, when I was working with my friend on our first startup, he did teach me a lot. So um, it did provide me some, some uh, uh, grounding and he taught me a lot of best practices. So that helped a lot because we worked together for a year and uh, we were doing pair programming as well. So we were like um, doing code reviews with each other's uh, code and that really helped a lot. Um, Cause I was studying law. So it was completely unrelated to computer science. Um, but one thing that, like I said, one thing that really helped me, uh, first thing is working together with a really good programmer. So if you have someone to coach you, to teach you, um, will improve much faster uh, than if you're just learning on your own. The second thing that I find was really helpful in um, teaching me how to code is to actually have a goal in mind. So you can't actually just read a book or read a tutorial and then you know expect to be able to code at the end of it. You must want to build something. So even when I was in college, I was freelance programming. Uh, so sure, I, you know I had clients. But uh, even outside of client work, I decided to do stuff. You know, I, I decided to build an e-commerce site from the ground up. You know, a shopping cart. You know, uh, member sign up page, members dashboard. I wanted to build everything from scratch because that is the best way to learn how to code. In fact, right now, same thing with Zappo. Um, anytime I need to build something, I feel like that's when my learning curve. You know, I'm learning my uh, at my fastest when I really need to build something. I see. So, yeah, I know what you mean, where if, when you're doing something, you learn way more than, say, theoretically learning about something. Yes. So I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So tell me, this is a second startup, right? Yes. What were the biggest mistakes you made in your first one? Like, why didn't the first one... Why did you have to start a second one? Like, what was your big takeaway? So, in the first startup, I think the biggest mistake is misidentifying a market. Because every entrepreneur who tries to start a SaaS product or any kind of online business, they, you know, it's very rare that the first idea takes off. So, we played with a lot of ideas. So we experimented with a lot of ideas for at least a year before we even chanced upon this idea of a Shopify for Groupon. So the number one mistake that we made was misidentifying the market. So we thought we had something that was going to be catching on to a long-term trend. But as it turned out, we were merely riding a short-term path. So that was very important because if the market is shrinking or stagnating, it, it, the rest really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good your product is. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter, you know, how much marketing you do. If the market is not growing at a healthy pace, then your startup dies. Period. So that's the first uh, mistake that we made. Second mistake, I would say, is that. I think that I started a startup at the wrong phase of my life because it's not that my startup just fizzled out and failed, you know? It's more like I was at a place in my life where I had other priorities other than building a successful startup. So I actually built my first startup to like ramen profitability. And, and that's pretty easy when you live abroad. But see, I was born and raised in Malaysia, and, and at the time I was in Malaysia. Um, if you live in India, you know that every one US dollar is equivalent to, you know, however many dollars in local currency. So Easy three or five, yeah. Yes. So, so my point is that it, it becomes very easy to become uh, complacent. So 
I was really young back then uh, when I started my first startup. I'm not really that young, but you know, young in my books, you know. Oh, should so I, I ask you the number? <laughs> <laughs> so I was 23 when I started my first startup. Um, oh, and I, is young. I mean, not that young, but still kind of young. Um, so I wanted to do a lot of things that didn't involve just sitting in an office and working 40, 50 hours a week. So I started to put my startup on a back burner. So I started to like work on it, like, you know, 10 hours a week, like put it on maintenance. I kind of stopped uh, adding new features. Um, and I just wanted to live life. I wanted to travel. I wanted to date girls. At one point I was like going to clubs every other night. Um, I was traveling every month. I was going on road trips, traveling overseas. Um, I was experimenting with like, you know, different career paths and um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, but, if you if you want to know what happened to the startup, um, so eventually, I I had a personal issue. So, like I said, I was experimenting with a lot of uh, career paths. So, mm -hmm. one of the things that I dabbled in was I became a political uh, blogger. And a crypto blogger. Yes, I became a political blogger. In two thousand eleven. The, in the early 2010s, that's nice. 20, you got there on time. Yes, you got there on time. <laughs> so, I uh, I I got into trouble with my government. There's a story of how I got got to the U.S. It's just not random. So I I you know I I said something that was too controversial about religion. So I went to prison for a while, and I had to escape the country. I came to the U.S. and because I didn't have the proper papers, I had to go to prison again in the U.S. while they sort out my uh, <laughs> asylum. You know, it's, it's, a, is, it's a mess. You know, my twenties were really like, sucks. yeah, I, I did a whole bunch of shit in my twenties. Um, the startup is is more like a footnote in my twenties. But um, yeah. Um, so what happened was I I had so I, I I was I was only in prison for a week in Malaysia. Um, I had to escape from Malaysia because I didn't want to face prosecution for some bullshit charges. So I came to the United States and I was in prison for four months. And by that point, uh, my co-founder had already moved on to another opportunity. He was working in Google. So I was a solo founder. Um, and when you don't touch your uh, startup for four months, um, you know, it naturally dies out. I mean, after 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 my my stint in immigration detention, um, I logged out and I I logged back in after four months, and I checked my MRR and it was uh it was still in the thousands. So like it's like not it's not like everyone canceled, but uh, you know what? I at that point I just lost all motivation to continue. And you I, were over it. Yeah, I was over it. I mean, I, I realized that you know what it's. This market is not growing, and in fact, by 2014, that was when I, you know, finally decided to shut it down. I realized that you know what, the market has moved on. Um, if you want to continue doing this, might as well start a new one. The market is really important. You know, I have a friend who tried yeah. starting a product around helping unemployed people improve their mindset, and it didn't work, of course. And the reason it didn't work was not because you know there wasn't like a, you know, a market there. The problem was that all the market was unemployed, so they didn't have any money. Absolutely. <laughs> so if you want to make some money, you got to like find the right market. You know, they got to have money. They need to be reachable, and yeah, and they need to be identifiable, and yeah, they need I to mean, be to, to, to even absolutely to even like uh, make your first dollar from your uh, from your business. Like one hundred things need to be like in order. Your ducks have to be all in a row. All the stars have to align. So it's not just the market, the product, your marketing, you know, everything has to be on point. But but as I said, you know, uh, the market is, is the most important thing because, um, and, and I, I believe the founder of Gumroad also talked about that because you can only grow as fast as the market grows. Even if you are the, the market leader in your niche, if your market is only growing, you know, 5% year over year, you're only going to grow thereabouts if you are the market leader. So you have to look for a market that is growing rapidly. And, and it's hard to tell because sometimes you get false signals. Just like 
when I uh, when I was starting my first startup, uh, we thought that you know daily deals and coupon is, is going to continue to be a big and huge thing. Um, but uh, it, it fizzled out after a while, so it's it's kind of hard to tell. Don't really know, and it's, sometimes it's luck you can call it, but I call it acumen. If you you know if you have the kind of foresight to see like you know ten years from now, twenty years from now, this is what's going to happen, um, and you have to just take a bet. You have to take a gamble. As an entrepreneur, you you never know everything when you start. Even after you start, even after you have customers, you still don't know everything. I see. It's like you know, in two thousand twenty, people who are selling masks or for you know made a killing. Oh, yeah. yeah. A killing because the market is just like thousand x in a okay. day. And uh, you know, there uh, there are a lot of uh, retailers who are caught. You know, stop calling a lot of masks. You know, they can they can get rid of it. You know. It's insane. How, you know, if the, if the market moves really quickly, you can have like the shittiest copy ever, yes, the shittiest that's, that's product ever, crazy. and still make money. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, if the market is growing very rapidly and it it can accommodate more than you know two or three players, um, you know, you still have a shot. Even though I wouldn't say a shitty product, but you still have to have like a workable, uh, like usable product. It it still has to at least basically work. It doesn't need to be the best product in the world. You can make a lot of mistakes, um, and your marketing can be crappy. You can even do no marketing. People will seek you out because the market is growing that rapidly. So if you pick a market that is actually growing, you know, very rapidly, um, it gives you a lot of leeway. You can make a lot of mistakes. The market will be very much more forgiving. And if you're trying to Conversely, if you're trying to work in a market that doesn't really exist or a market that is shrinking, it's it really doesn't matter how perfect your product is. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter what kind of marketing you do. Um, you're not going to succeed. So the market is paramount. Yeah, like it's like trying to be a PUA in an Islamic country or something like that. You know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You go. Gotta... No, no doesn't. you go. Got to go where the fish are. Yeah. So tell me, Jay, how is it like to be in prison? What is it? What is a Malaysian prison actually like? Uh, so it's complicated, but I'll summarize it. So because I was in prison for posting something politically sensitive, um, I was I, I posted something about uh, the Muslim practice of fasting during the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I understand the rationale behind. Uh, fasting, but what I don't understand is why they have to involve the government. So in, in, in Muslim countries, for example, in Malaysia, during the month of Ramadan, if you're Muslim and you're caught eating in public uh, during the daytime, they find you, they arrest you. So I thought that was very stupid. So I, I, I decided to uh, create some political satire based around that. But uh, it went viral in the wrong way. And, um, you know, not every country has free speech. In fact, uh, I think America is probably the only country in the world where you can't be arrested for something you post online. So, um, so I had a lot so of give it time. What's that? Give it time. Give it time. Oh, <laughs> oh well, we'll see. We'll see. You know, um, but the point is that um, I was entering uh, Malaysian prison as like a very kind of just like hateable person. So they had How to. How old were you back then? I was twenty. Oh, yeah. So, in uh, since Malaysia is a majority Muslim country, um, that you know that holds true for the prison population as well. So, I was actually assaulted and threatened my first day in prison. It was really scary. You know, I thought I was going to die. Um, but uh, thank God, you know, they they sort of like separated me. They gave me my own cell. Um, sort of like solitary confinement, but you know, still alive. Uh, yeah, was it was good. I was thankful for it because, you know, otherwise in Gen Pop, I was probably going to get beat up. So. Because in, in Malaysia, and not just Malaysia, all Muslim countries, they take their religion very, very seriously. They are willing to die for it. So, you know, saying anything that is even remotely critical of the Muslim, of the Islam, Islamic religion, um, you know, they are willing to die for it, defending the honor of the religion. They take it very seriously. Um, yeah, it was, it was tough. But I was only there for like nine days. It was okay. 
Um, and then, like I said, I came to America. I was in ICE detention, immigration and customs. Wait, so how does it work? How do you get to America when you, say, were in prison for nine days? Like, do they just let you catch a flight? <laughs> it's, it's a bit complicated, but I was I was in prison for nine days because they denied me bail at first. But that's the funny thing. After they denied me bail, there was like a public outcry because like even like rapists and robbers get bail, but this political blogger uh somehow gets the night bail so there was like a huge uh like counter public outcry because they didn't think that i deserved to be the night bail so after um a while my lawyer fought for me to be uh granted bail after nine days um they released me um but they took away my passport so it was it, it made things very complicated um but uh about I was affecting my case in 2014, but I was supposed to go to Singapore to shoot a documentary about my whole journey, uh, you know, going to prison and all that stuff. So I made an application to the Malaysian government to ask for permission to go to Singapore to shoot a documentary. And uh, for some reason, they allowed me to go to Singapore, you know, and uh, I was like, I went to Singapore and I was like, wait a second, I don't have to go back. So I just bought a plane ticket. <laughs> I was like, what? Wait a second. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? I didn't even shoot the documentary. I just told I just told like the, the studio that was trying to shoot us, uh, shoot shoot my story. I was like, um, can't make it. So I was like, Yeah, immediately I just bought a ticket to Mexico. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing, man? You know? yeah. I know it's hilarious. <laughs> so you went to Mexico then? Yes, I went to Mexico, and um, when I arrived in Mexico, they were like, "What are you trying to do here? Why are you flying to this town?" Because I flew to Tijuana. Tijuana is on the border between Mexico and the United States and California. And and when I was when I touched down in Mexico, they pulled me into an interrogation room for like an hour, and they were like, "What are you doing here? What are you trying to do?" Us. So I was scared because I I didn't want to be truthful to them that I wanted to go to the United States because who knows what, what they might do, you know? So I said, you know, I, uh, I'm just a traveler. I just wanted to, uh, you know, enjoy a holiday. And, and <laughs> you know, I had to justify my presence there. And, and they, they started to uh, run checks on my name, my passport. Um, they interrogated me for an hour. They asked me like tons of questions. They run through my stuff. Um, but like trying to figure out, like, we don't get a lot of visitors from this country, Malaysia. And let alone to Tijuana, which is not really a hot spot for international tourists. So what you know, what are your intentions? You know, but uh, yeah, finally they just let me enter the country, and from there I just uh, made it made my way to uh, the United States. Uh, before that, I had to hire an immigration lawyer um, because I didn't want to go in blind. So I went to the border and. I surrendered myself to the border and said, you know what, I want to apply for political asylum. And yeah, they, they say, you know what, yeah, we'll we'll take you in, but you have to sit in prison while we examine your claim, basically. Interesting. So you, I, you know, when you said you went to Mexico, I just figured, you know, you did the thing where you just crossed the border inside like a big hay bale or something, and you actually did the legal process. That's interesting. It's, it's technically speaking legal, yeah. Um, and then Donald Trump came on, came, came later on, and came up with a new policy, which is a wait in Mexico policy, which means that if you have a claim for political asylum, if you're seeking asylum, um, then you can't just come into the U.S. anymore. You have to wait in Mexico. So my timing was kind of right too, because I entered when Obama was president. So yeah, that's, going that's back to the reasons too. It's, um, no, I was saying, I was saying um, that was one of the reasons too. When I came to America, I just I, I tried to steer clear of like political stuff. Like back in my home country, I was so outspoken about politics and that, uh, you know, it got me in trouble. So I'm like, you know what, right now you have, um, you know, they have something they can blackmail you with. So, um, you know, try to be a more apolitical, you know, keep a, keep, keep a head low, maybe, you know, start a tech startup that's safe, you know, that's not going to land you in hot suit. Makes complete sense, man. Like, I would lay low too if I was in that situation. 
Like yeah, having, you know, having to leave your country. I was so into politics, so. Yeah, it, it seems like a horrible situation, especially for a 24-year-old. Like, no, man, that's like too much. Yeah. Like, to have to leave uh, your country and like do this, do that, go to Mexico and then go to the US. Like, so going back to the topic of SaaS, tell me what exactly do you need to learn if you want to start a SaaS company? What do you need to know and what did you learn that wasn't useful to you? Mm. See, this is very it's a very good question and obviously it's my personal opinion. But I think the first thing you should have is an ability to weather the ups and downs because when you're starting a SaaS the downs are like really demotivating. Like even if you have an up and running SaaS, you will have some bad days that just make you question your entire existence. So you must really have a mental toughness, that mental strength to like just never um, just say like, you know what, I'm just going to move on from this. Um, I'm going to throw in a towel. I'm going to give up. Nope. If you're that kind of person, you're might as well you don't you don't even start it in the first place because this is not for the faint of heart. So the first thing that uh, you should have is a very strong uh, mindset. Like you're gonna have to want this really badly. So you have to examine your motivations, make sure that why you're doing this is actually um, cohesive with your ultimate purpose in life. You can't just do this for fun. You can't just treat it as like, oh, you know what? This is a side hustle. No, this is going to be the hardest thing that you ever do in your life. So. That's the first thing. You have to be mentally very strong. You have to be prepared for all the downs. Highs are going to be really high. You know, someday you're going to have like, oh, you know what? There are like 10, 15 new subscriptions. You're going to be like, oh, yes, I'm a genius. You know, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> but the next day, you know, you know, the next day or the next month even, oh, you know what? Uh, next month, uh, you have like more accounts canceling than uh, accounts that are actually upgrading. And then you start questioning yourself again. You're like, Holy shit, I worked really, really hard this month. I added X number of features. I fixed Y number of bugs. And this is how my hard work is rewarded. So, you know, first of all, the, the mental strength has to be there. You're going to have to want this really badly. Um, that's the most important thing. Second, second of all, I would say um, you're going to be, have to be kind of good at identifying markets. A lot of people especially new entrepreneurs, they try to be clever, they try to be innovative instead of useful. And that tends to be the downfall of, you know, a large number of aspiring entrepreneurs. They think that, you know what, um, I'm a genius. I'm going to create something that is completely new. You know, nobody has ever seen this. And I'm going to be first to market, you know, and I'm going to corner this market. I'm going to, you know, be the household name for this market niche. But you need to be cautious when you have that mentality because you're not the only genius in the world you know most likely if there is a market there's an untapped market people have thought about it there's a saying that you know if it's a good market it's going to have five competitors if it's a great market it's going to have 15 competitors so when you're talking about you, you think you've identified a market but you can't even identify like you know five competitors who are actually doing well in your space you know i would deeply question that you've actually identified a market that is worth pursuing. So that's the second thing. You, you need to be able to read and, and identify markets. See, see, the first two things that I mentioned is I haven't even gone into stuff like, you know, you got to be able to code and all that stuff, you know, because that you can learn along the way. But if you don't have these two things, um, it, it's going to be really hard to get even your first sale, let alone, you know, get your SaaS to profitability. So obviously, the third thing I would think is that I would think is that you need the hard skill. But uh, then again, I don't think you need to be like at expert level for that. Like for example, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, he admits on multiple occasions that he's like a very average coder. Like he's not like the best uh, programmer out there. But you know, Mark Zuckerberg is is really good at um, you know just knowing what people want, knowing what the future is going to be. He can foresee the future to, to some extent. So that's that's what that's what makes you know a lot of entrepreneurs. That's why we talk about people like Elon Musk, right? This guy has a lot of foresight. You know, he can tell what's going to be big in the future before it even becomes big. 
So that's very important, the ability to read markets. If you have that and you have a really uh, strong mental state, I think um, you'll be unstoppable. I see, I see. I agree with that to a large extent. A lot of people quit too soon. They're like, okay, they try something and they're like, okay, it's not working, I'm gonna leave. But really, firstly, they haven't even done the work yet. For example, you can't start a business without researching who exactly is your customer, who are your competitors, etc. And people just create something and then expect it to succeed. Like, if I make it, they'll come. Right. And I think that mindset is it's, it's very bad, but not because it's just a waste of time and energy, because... You know, nothing is more common than in the SaaS space uh, or startup space in general, where, you know, a, a developer, he spends six months, 12 months, sometimes 18 months just building the product, not even putting it out there, not even trying to get users. And then at 18 months, he's like, oh, finally, I'm done, you know, launch it. And then what happened? Crickets. And then one month later, you know, he's been pushing it relentlessly to people. Nobody cares. Nobody even wants to sign up, let alone pay for it. And then... It's not so much that he wasted his time and energy that's that. The most important thing is that he wasted his his spirit, his trust, and his faith in the process. If you work hard, really hard in your life once, and then you're not rewarded with the success that you think you expect and you think you deserve, it completely demoralizes you. It, it, it destroys your willpower and your motivation um, for the next venture or possibly forever. You'll be like, you know what? Fuck this shit. Hard work is a lie. It it disillusions you. That's why I find that it's it's very damaging to the mindset of an entrepreneur if he creates something once and then he realizes, you know what? Hard work doesn't necessarily lead to success. And why am I going to work hard? I'm just gonna just work for a company and just call it call it a day. That's my life, you know. So that's the most dangerous thing. You cannot lose faith in the process. You cannot think that hard work does not lead to success. Does hard work lead to success? I would say, yes, it's a necessary condition of success, but it's not a sufficient condition for success. You need hard work plus other things to succeed. So hard work alone, um, not going to succeed because it, it's, it's like you have to have the right map to get to the right destination. So it doesn't matter how good your navigation of skills are. If you have the wrong map, you're going to end up in the wrong place. It doesn't matter, you know, like if you're an expert, you know, super skilled navigator. If the map is wrong, you know, you're not going to get to your destination. So that's the analogy that I would use to describe. So if you're going to invest a lot of hard work into something, make sure that your compass is pointed to the exact right coordinate before you invest hard work in that direction. Have you ever come across this phrase that says, like, not planning is planning to fail? Yes, absolutely. A lot of plan is like that. Go ahead, sorry. No, I, I was saying that uh, you were talking about failing to plan is planning to fail, right? That's the same. Yes. So yes. what technical skills would you recommend people know? So I... Get the mindset. Let's say someone has the right mindset. They are there. They have time to work, but they don't know how to code or they they have no idea of how to actually build something. Let's say they've identified a market. They have the money. They have the time. What skills do they need to learn? So if you're already a developer, the, the best advice I can offer is to stick to what you already know. In, uh, when, when you're a developer, there are a lot of cool new technology all the time. And you never know what's going to stick around. Like when I when I was coding heavily in college, like Ruby or Rails were huge. And when I started Blapo in late 2019, you know, Ruby on Rails is not cool anymore. You know, people are coding with, with other things. People are coding with React, Node, you know, some of the cooler technologies. So it, what really matters is that you can code efficiently and effectively for your startup. It doesn't matter like if you're not using the, the newest technologies. What's more important, you use what you are familiar with and what you understand. Now, that's for if you're a, co a coder. If you're not a coder, I think you have to ask yourself uh, very honestly if 
marketing is something that you can learn very quickly. Because if you've identified a market and you have created a solution, at least in your mind, you have conceptualized a solution, um, you don't necessarily have to build it yourself. You can find a co-founder, a coder, um, uh, build it together, and then you can work on marketing and you can work on getting leads, getting investors if that's necessary. Um, so if you think you can learn coding fast, definitely learn it. Um, if not, I would say uh, just focus on getting a co-founder, focus on the uh, sales and marketing side of the business, which is more important than the coding part anyway. Makes sense. But still, if someone does want to learn how to code, they really do want to build a software themselves or they can't find a co-founder, where do they start? Like what courses should they do? What languages should they learn? That's, that's a very good question. If, if I were to be specific, I would recommend the front end uh, that newbies focus on mastering JavaScript. And just JavaScript, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about any framework, not Vue, not React, none of that yet. Just focus on pure vanilla JavaScript on the front end. And on the back end, I would recommend something like Python um, because Python has the uh, simple syntax. It's, I would say it's the most beginner friendly back end uh, programming language that you can learn. So Python and JavaScript, and that's enough just to start. And the next thing you need to learn, obviously for the front end, you need to learn some HTML as well. That's, that's a given. Um, Wait, what did you say? Um, we missed some audio there. Uh, you need to obviously learn? HTML. HTML, okay, yeah. Yes, for the front end. Um, but if you have those three basics, which is Python, JavaScript, and HTML, um, the, the next thing is I, I, I would recommend is for them to think of a very small project that they want to build. So, Usually I recommend something very simple because 99% of SaaS uh, products out there, it's their crude software. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term crude, C-R-U-D. It stands for create, read, update, and delete. Like 99% of SaaS software out there, they just do these four basic things, which is create data, read data, update data, and delete data. So that's the four uh, very basic, like, uh, business logic that you have to learn to perform uh, with your backend language with Python. Um, so you have to think of a project that actually encapsulates uh, those principles. So I, I would say like maybe uh, something like a discussion forum. So a newbie should try to build a discussion forum using Python and HTML. It's possible. Um, so like in a discussion forum, you will, you will learn stuff like how to create a topic, right? How to create a comment, how to edit a comment, how to delete a comment, and how to create a, a web page to display the entire thread when it's being clicked on. And when you go to the forum main page, how do you display a list of all the topics? So it's 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 a crude, the, the simplest crude software that I can think of, create, read, update, delete. So that's, uh, um, I would say, always focus on the smallest project that you think that you can build and uh, take it from there. You remind me of my MySQL days when I was learning MySQL. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you know what? If, uh, if, if you have some time, you should also learn MySQL or database language as well. Uh, because eventually, you know, when you're building a software, um, you're going to have to deal with the database. So you got to have to learn SQL. Um, you have to learn how to set up databases, you have to learn some DevOps, you have to learn sysadmin, but that comes later. Obviously, as a beginner, I would definitely recommend learning stuff that you can have like an immediate uh, payoff, how do I put it, like a like an immediate uh, dopamine hit. So if you work on something that is like database, like you can't really see how it's relevant. It doesn't motivate you even if you succeed in like, okay, so I've placed data in the database, so what, you know? But if you build, for example, the front end, like even if you just build a comment box that you know you can type in, and when you click comment and you refresh the page, the comment actually displays. You know, then you can see, holy shit, I did that. You know, it's like magic. I did that. I typed a few lines of code, and then that happened. Holy crap! You know, and then you become motivated because you can see some results, uh, some fruit from your labor. That's why I don't 
really just recommend people to just like follow tutorial after tutorial. Um, that's not really ideal for your motivation because motivation comes when you see that there's progress. You need to see like units of progress along the way. So if you learn something like a database and you learn like, you know, 10,000, uh, like you learn a thousand commands, uh, SQL commands, like, okay, you can do this. And, but it's not cool. You don't see, you don't have the sensory payoff. You don't have that dopamine rush. Mm. Yeah. I see. So it's like what you mentioned. It, it reinforces trust in the process. Like I put in some yes. work, now I get results. Yes, yeah, exactly. And, and that's very important because, you know, I see a lot of people who have already lost trust in the process and sometimes you can't regain it. You know, you have to be like a super optimistic person if you want to be an entrepreneur because there will be failures. And if, if, if some people, you know, they, they fail five, seven, ten times and they're like, okay, fuck the shit, I'm not built for it, you know. Um, so they've already completely lost trust in the process. They become disillusioned. Um, you don't want to get there. You know, you really don't want to get there. Um, if you if you find that you're losing faith, you know, sometimes I even tell entrepreneurs to just look back at the past uh, progress or, or wins that you have. You know, sometimes, you know, even me, like when I'm feeling down, I'll just go look, read back, you know, some of the old like customer support emails where they're like, oh, you know, I really love your software. You know, it really helped me to do this, this, this and that. And it made me feel happy. It just got my spirits and it told me that, you know what, um, this, is just a, this is just a minor setback in the grand scheme of things. You know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, people like what I'm doing. You know, so motivation is very important because, um, you know, without motivation, your body, you know, it, it's going to be lifeless. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to want to do anything because your body and your mind has to be convinced that there will be a reward eventually if um, you follow the process. I completely understand what you mean by this, man. This is yeah. something I went through a lot especially back in the day when i was studying to be a chartered accountant where you know if you're like studying something that's not super useful you you kind of feel like what are you doing versus you study something that you know is going to come in the exam you're like okay I'm, i i need to master the subject so i can pass a stupid exam yeah yeah i mean uh, this is very common in college you know like a lot of college students are just like asking us what the fuck am i doing you know just trying to just learn this stuff it's not going to be useful beyond the exam and um yeah you know motivation has to come from within you know if you want to learn how to code you want to learn how to build software i think you're going to have to have a very strong reason why you want to do it you can't just say oh you know what this is my site so i'm going to do it um on the evenings and uh on the weekend sometimes if i feel like it you know oh, you know if you do that you get you're dead in the water even before you start because it like needs I said, to be a number one focus, yeah. Yeah, it has to be. It has to be. If you start a startup, uh, it has to be the number one purpose in your life. Like it's there's no there's no number two or number three. If it's number two or number three, you're gonna be dead. So, how did you get your first customers? Though, let's say that you built your software, you're really focused, and you know you have what it takes. But how do you actually get the money? Right. That's a very good question. And a lot, uh, a lot of people have asked me the same question as well. Um, so I got the first customer for uh, the first customer for Zappo in, uh, in December 2019. Um, and then after that, it was just like like two or three more because I was still working a day job uh, in 2019 and early 2020. But during the COVID lockdown, um, I got laid off from my day job. So I was a bartender in West Hollywood. And uh, they had to close all, like, you know, the bars and restaurants. I'm not sure if you remember remember that two years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if they did that in India, but they definitely did that in the United States. No, no, so, they did that um, in I India. They yeah, would be too late if you went out. <laughs> I, so I was laid off from my job uh, back in uh, March 2020. So I realized that, you know what, right now I, I don't have anything to do. And and that was back then they were giving out the free money, that, you know, you know how it, the United States printed like four trillion dollars in the past two years. It was when they were like giving out a lot of free money, like uh, they were giving out like unemployment income. They were giving out like stimulus checks and all that. And so, uh, throughout twenty twenty, I was making like four thousand dollars a month, not from Zappo, not not yet at least, um, from just the government. Like they were just giving me money just because. So I was like, holy shit, this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity for me to 
bootstrap Zappo full time without any distraction. Because when I started Zappo, I was still having a day job and it was very distracting. You know, starting a startup and having a day job at the same time, if you can do it, you are great. But I'm I'm not that talented, you know. Like I, I feel like it's it's like my progress was so slow. Like it slowed to a crawl. Like I was building features, I was like I was like um signing on new customers but the progress was really slow because i only have a limited number of hours and more importantly my you know sometimes i get mentally exhausted as well because you only have so much mental bandwidth when you're you know working on two hard things at once so when march 2020 came about i i, I realized that you know what i had all this free time to work full-time on zappo and that's when like most of my customers they start pouring in um that was because like you know, just because like when I work full time, I didn't, I wasn't like, you know, times more productive or anything. I was like 10, 20, 30 times more productive because I, I can only focus on one thing. Um, so when I was finally working full time, I, I started, I decided to like finally work on marketing like quite seriously. So I started a, a Zappo blog. I started uploading a lot of content. I started engaging a lot in the Twitter uh, space. Um, and Finally, I decided to just like, you know what? You're new. Nobody even knows you exist. It doesn't matter how loudly you shout to your like, what? I had like a hundred something followers on my Zappo Twitter account back then. Um, nobody's going to hear you. So as a really new startup, you can't just wait for people to come to you. People are not going to notice you. It's extremely noisy out there on the internet. You have to go to people. So I decided, you know what? I'm just going to identify influencers in the Twitter space. And I just send them DMs. I was like, you know what? I'm starting this new startup. It does this, 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 and that. This is how it's going to make your life better. This is how it's, how it's going to enhance your experience and trying to build a and monetize your audience on Twitter. Um, here is a discount link for you. Um, why don't you try it out? So I sent at least, I sent a lot. I sent a lot of DMs. Like most days I run out of DMs to send. Like Twitter tells me, like you know what, you gotta slow down. You know, you can't send this many DMs. So every day for like a few weeks in March 2020, I just send DM after DM after DM. And sometimes um, people report my my stuff. That's fine. Sometimes people got angry, like you know what, this is not the way to market your business. You know, why are you doing this? This is so spammy. You know, um, but the good thing is a lot of people also responded uh, positively. So. That's how I actually signed up my first ten uh, paid customers. I just reached out to them directly on DM. I'm like, a lot of people think that's very spammy. I'm like, fuck it. I have no customers. I have nothing to lose at this point. What's gonna happen? What's the worst that can happen? You know. Hmm. Yep. So that's I remember. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. At one point, I was uh kind of just spamming DMs. But, uh, I mean, now every now and then, I still do that. Right now, you know, um, when I have free time. Um, but um, the point is that I, I feel like as a new startup, it is, it is a lot more effective to go to people than to wait for people to come to you. People will come to you eventually when you have built up your brand, you have built up your word of mouth marketing, you know, you have built up your affiliate network. People will come to you then. But before you have all that stuff, you know what? You just have to be proactive. You have to go out there, reach out to people. If you get rejected, you get rejected. If you get scolded by people, so be it. Makes sense, man. If you're not willing to pitch your own stuff, like if you don't believe in yourself, other people won't either. Absolutely. And I when... remember back yeah. in the day. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I remember back in the day, you were using AppSumo to get customers. How did that go? Would you recommend other people use them too? Um. Yes, especially if you're starting out, I feel like uh, the cash infusion is going to be very good for your motivation. Um, it's going to help you to gain a lot of positive reviews. It's going to help you gain backlinks. You know, other sites are going to review your app, so it's going to help you to gain some of that positive word of mouth as well. Um, but I don't, I don't think it should be um, used or relied upon as a long-term strategy. So it's, it's okay if it's if it's a revenue stream that's actually working out for you, but eventually as a SaaS business, if you want to scale up, you're going to have to focus on your subscription-based customers. 
I see. I see. Yes. I think you're the only product that actually has lifetime subscriptions. How does that come to be? Like everyone does monthly subscriptions. Like you pay every month, but Zlapo has the option of paying lifetime. Like you pay once and then you have it forever. So tell me the rationale behind that. Oh. So the rationale is it's very simple. Nobody really like paying monthly for anything. If if you ask any entrepreneur who has tried to sell subscriptions and also sell something that's like a one-off expense, like an ebook or um, you know, a WordPress team or anything, you will know that selling things that is a one-time expense is a lot easier than selling something that's an ongoing expense. It doesn't even matter what the price is. The price can be like $200, $300. People are way more willing to shell out $200 or $300 if it's once and done versus, you know, shelling out $50 month after month after month after month. After month. So that's one thing. I think that it's a business model. Um, as beneficial for my customers um i feel that i can build a lot of customer loyalty around the fact that i am willing to meet them in the middle um so you see the thing about offering lifetime deals you got to be very careful um if you offer lifetime deals at a price that is way too low then you have to you find yourself having to support customers for life and you're gonna have ongoing support ongoing uh, future improvements, bug fixes, all that. And they're, in a way, they're dead weight. You know what I mean? Because they're not paying you money anymore. So when you're doing that, you have to do it very cautiously. You have to look at your data. What is the lo- average lifetime value of your subscription customer? So if your, your subscription customer is paying you, for example, an average of $20 a month, and they stay with you an average of 12 months, so really, the lifetime value of a subscription customer is 20 times 12, right? So it's $240. Mm-hmm. So if you are going to sell a lifetime deal at $299, technically speaking, you are coming out on top. Do you agree with this um, calculus? Technically, I, we have some audio issues. What did you say there? Technically speaking, you are coming out? Technically speaking, do you agree with my calculation? The average user stays for 12 months and the average amount that they pay per month is $20. So the lifetime value of a customer is $240. Am I right? I agree with you there. However, I've come across issues, for example, like there was an airline company that gave people tickets that they can use forever. So you pay us like $80,000 once. And then you can fly however, wherever you want, whenever you want for the rest of your life. And, they and realized, that turned out to be like a bad deal for the airline. <laughs> yes, because um, there'll be. You see, the thing about the thing about airlines is that there's always there's incremental cost for airlines because every flight where you are, you know, blocking off the seat to this guy who's not paying money, you're losing money from actually a paying passenger, right? But when you mm-hmm. come to SaaS, SaaS doesn't really have like uh, cost of goods sales. We, it, there's there's no like unit cost or anything. This is all just overhead. It's all just server fees. It's all just um, you know you're paying for your other SaaS software, for example, to run your company. So there's it's it's all just fixed cost. And I feel that when people say that you know what, oh now your users are all gonna abuse your product. They're gonna use it all the time. They're gonna use it day in and day out. And then you're gonna have a huge number of users that you have to support for life while not paying you. Um, you know I find that that worry is like super overblown because if you do a study on like every product that offers lifetime deals you'll find that only a small percentage of lifetime deal users are actually power users like the vast majority of them they buy it out of fomo they buy it because it's cheap they buy it because the reviews are good they buy it just in case they have to use it one day they buy it because there's a timer there and they don't want to miss out on a deal that they potentially will not see ever again so a lot of these people, like when we talk about churn, we talk about subscription customers, they churn. Churn is a term uh, used to describe cancellation. So every SaaS has a lifetime, like average number of months that the, the, uh, the subscriber stays with you. It's not forever. It's never forever. It's always like, you know, 12 months, you know, 24 months, if you're really good, whatever. 
um, but eventually they turn. So there is also a turn when it comes to lifetime view users. There are some lifetime users who use your product for a few days, a few weeks, and they never ever touch it again. So when you say that, uh, you no, know, they're going to get the better of you, maybe a minority, a very small minority of users. But for the vast majority of users, I think uh, you'll come out on top. Makes sense. Makes sense. I do yeah. think that like most say, people software, will be honest. Like software is digital real estate. You have like unlimited amount of land that you can lease out, and it wouldn't cost you a, a penny extra. So it's anything you know that is like software based, you know, like you don't really have to worry about it because it's it's a fixed cost. It's not like your costs go up if if they use it every day, you know. Hmm. Yeah. So, so it's like you slightly have... just. Slightly different discussion. Like, say for example, if I was running a buffet dinner, a buffet restaurant, and I say, you know what? If you pay me ten thousand dollars, you can eat here every day for life. Yeah, that that one's <laughs> gonna be in trouble because food is not really spicy. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. The good thing about software is that it's scalable. If I create one feature, I push it out to like, you know, I don't push it out to one user. I push it out to all users. So it doesn't cost me extra to build that. You get you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. Basically, the marginal cost is zero. The marginal so, cost take, is zero. Yeah. But I've heard people like other entrepreneurs who are also in tech. They say they don't do lifetime deals because sometimes it's like, you know, it adds to the customer support team, like the work of the customer support team, which oftentimes turns out to be their biggest expense. Yes. Um. That one, I think it's it's uh. You have to talk in terms of product to product. Every product is different. I don't feel that there's a huge customer support uh, burden from having lifetime real users. Um, I feel that the support is about the same. I feel like a large number of customer support inquiries is a symptom of something else. Usually it's because your product is not intuitive enough. Maybe it's confusing. Maybe. You know the onboarding is complicated. Maybe you haven't provided them enough uh, help documents so that they can help themselves before they start ordering customer service. So if customer support has a very large amount of um, inquiries, I would start uh, looking into the product itself as well. Obviously, mm -hmm. if you're growing at a super rapid pace, so obviously your customer support queries are going to scale proportionally. But if you're like you know, just drowning in customer support queries. Um, you know what? I think it's time to do some, uh, how do I call it, classification of what kind of customer support queries are you getting. And like, you know, you're going to realize that X amount is just dealing with this issue, and Y amount is dealing with this issue. You have to ask yourself, is there something that we can build into the product um, that would make these queries right here uh, reduce them, you know, decrease, make them decrease. So yeah, that's my take on it. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. I know what you're talking about. You know, some software are so unintuitive. Like you use, you you know, you log in, the dashboard is so complex that you have no idea how to start. And then you have no option but to like ask customer support. Okay, so do you have a tutorial? Like how do I actually use this thing? And then you find yourself getting in the habit of asking every small thing to customer support. So how yeah. do I do this? Instead of even trying to like find it, I just like ask them. Yeah. So um, customer support, you know, it's, just, it's, it's something that grows proportionately with your growth. But if, if you're having something that is like, um, you know, way, way more than you can handle, I would actually start seeing, because customer support rates are a symptom. They are never, you know, they're never just because there's always something wrong that is leading to an inordinate amount of emails or uh, live tests, or especially for the same issue. Hey, I know what you're talking about. However, no matter what you do, there's always no matter how foolproof your system is, there's always a greater fool, you know. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, but and, like few you know I I always appreciate the opportunity to uh, just banter with my users and my customers. It's okay, you know. Like, uh, you know, I I personally I enjoy. It. Some people think it's an annoyance to like deal with customers. 
personally, I enjoy it. Like, I like talking to them. I like, you know, seeing how they use it. Um, what I don't really like is when they repeatedly, um, like, ask for a feature that, you know, like, I, I would be reluctant to integrate, for example. Like, for example, some, some things I just don't think it's in my best interest to integrate. Uh, there are some users who are asking for, like, uh, like a mass DM uh, kind of feature, you know, where they can just pop in a list of, like, uh, uh, Twitter handles, and then it sends the same message to them, you know. And my software is supposed to, like, space them out so that it doesn't trip over the, the Twitter spam filters and all that. I'm like, yeah, you know, for example, something like that, I wouldn't integrate it. Hmm. I wonder if you could have a middle ground if you actually want to build that. Maybe you could take the Twitter's API from the customer itself in the sense that instead of using your own developer account. So for some features, you could have the customer make their own dev account and then put their own API key in. So in case they get flagged, the customer gets flagged and not you. But yeah, yeah that's kind of up here. It's if they're still using my, if you're still using my website to use it, uh, Twitter is going to ask me. So why are you using a customer's API key? You know, you're not supposed to do that. Oh, you know, it's okay. I didn't know that. You know, it's against their terms. You know, like startups like mine, you know, you got to be really careful because if if you just put her off, you know, the whole thing's gone. You know, what what is the business going to do if it it, it doesn't it, it it doesn't integrate with Twitter anymore? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of like putting all of your eggs in one basket, if you ask me. Maybe you should yeah. expand to um, other social networks. Ideal. Too. It's really not ideal, and I'm I'm aware of that. But um, there are also companies that are you know million dollar companies that are built entirely on another company as well. So you can't really say that in a way it's a ticking time bomb. It's like building on, you know, quicksand. But you know, it's a risk that you can mitigate. It's a risk that will never go away, but it's a risk that you can mitigate. Like a lot of uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, most entrepreneurs, they have they charge monthly via a payment processor called Stripe. Mm -hmm. So if Stripe bans them, they lose everything. You know, because they don't they don't own uh, the customer data. They don't have access to the full um, credit card numbers and billing details of their customers. They don't. So Stripe bans you, and you know they say, you know what? Um, we're not gonna allow you to, uh, you know, because you violated our our whatever, you know, our terms. That's it. You lose all your subscriptions. It's like poof. Overall, uh, overnight, your MRR goes to zero. So that's okay. And this isn't even theoretical, you know, this happens to people. Like if you take yeah, Gab for Gab dot IO. Stripe is just like PayPal, you know, sometimes you, you're not doing anything wrong. You didn't even do anything, you know, that's against your terms. You don't even have like a high number of projects or anything like that. Um they just decide, you know what? You're a high risk business, we're not gonna support you anymore. And then poof, overnight your MR <laughs> like what the hell? I work my life. You know, <laughs> past, you know, two, three, four, five years to build this, and you just, you know, yank it from the bottom like that. You know, you just pull the plug. You just rock pull me like that. You know, that's crazy. <laughs> See, this so, is why we need crypto, Jay. This is why we need crypto in the world. Yeah, um, in, uh, for a lot of like entrepreneurs, but that's the thing. If you want to bootstrap, you can't build everything from scratch. You're gonna have to use all these turnkey services, and a lot of these services, it's like, um. They lock you in. Um, it's just a risk that you just have to accept. It's a risk. I'm not gonna lie. Platform risk is a real risk. You know, if 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 you build your website, your SaaS that only integrates with Amazon, um, you know, AWS, right? And all the integrations are to AWS. Just like my first startup, I built on Google App Engine. Right now, they call it a uh, Google. I don't know cloud GCS? Cloud, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, they call it G, G, yeah, Google Cloud Service. Yeah, back then it was called Google App Engine. You have to write uh, specific customizations to uh, integrate with the uh, their platform. Um, so if, if they ban you, yeah, you can migrate to another platform, but it's not going to be painless. You know what I mean? So right now, Zappo is hosted on DigitalOcean, um, but um, they're not in any way proprietary like Amazon. So we're all, you know, we're set up on a Linux operating system. Um, we do double backups for our database. So um, it's not something that's, you know, if, if they kick us out for any reason whatsoever, 
you know, we can do a seamless migration within hours. Makes sense. And by the way, for people who think this is like a tail risk doesn't happen to anyone, this actually does happen a lot. Like Parler got kicked out of, it was growing faster than Twitter and maybe would have overtake Twitter. Parler was a Twitter replacement. And then Amazon just kicked it out, like poof. And Parler just died. Like no one uses it anymore that I know of. Yeah, and people are using it back then. Not even just for political reasons. Sometimes, you know, for very harmless or inexplicable reasons, you know. And you can write as many emails or uh, make as many calls as you want. They're not going to. They're not even going to give you an explanation for what happened. You just have to deal with it. And um, that's why I, I'm also a bit. Sometimes I'm a bit um, like I tell entrepreneurs to be a bit cautious when they try to sell through the App Store or even through the Google Play Store, uh, because now you are giving a gatekeeper uh, to your business. You know, if if you do anything that they don't like, or even they want to come up with an like a, a competitive product to yours, like a product that's that's competing with yours, they can just like pull the plug on yours and completely shut you out. So that's a risk that's you know, uh, it's real. It's a real risk. It's not just theoretical. It happens. These things happen. So if if you're if you're a bootstrapping entrepreneur, you know, you really have no choice. Like, what are you gonna do? You're gonna build your own payment processor. You know, what you're gonna set up your own servers. You're going to set up your own servers and run your own server from your house? No, you're just going to use one of those turnkey services. You're going to use uh, Amazon AWS. You're going to use Google Cloud. You know, you're going to use Heroku. You're going to use uh, DigitalOcean because it's just easier. It just gets you up and running and your product in front of customer much faster. So it's not it even is- possible for people to, like, restart everything. You know, like, uh, you can't reinvent everything at once like either, unless you have like a lot of funding and a huge team and you know a lot even, of runway you can't even then you still have to like um use a lot of turnkey services you're gonna have to integrate with certain apis you're gonna have to um just put a lot of dependency into your business it's inevitable like if someone has found like a, a solution to this problem i'm all ears but right now to me this is just a risk that you can mitigate it's not something that you can completely eliminate so it's for example, like, you, know, you want to go to a restaurant and then like, first you got to build a road, then you got to build a car, then you got to build a restaurant. Exactly. exactly. It's like, what? You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you know? But, but if you want to get up and running as soon as possible, you don't have a choice. You have to use some of these services and some of these services are going to be pretty much like there is a strong vendor locked in uh, factor. I see. And, the best you can do is just follow their terms as, as closely as possible. I see, I see. So going back a bit, mm-hmm. how do you actually price your product? Like, how do you come out with the right prices? Should you charge 20 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month, 1,000 bucks a month? That's a good question. Um, personally, I, I just do what most people do, which is um, when you're a new entrepreneur, you tend to have, like... You know, low self esteem and imposter syndrome. So you start off at like a typical like ten dollars a month because at that point you are a beggar and beggars can be choosers. So you tend to pitch your product. I see most entrepreneurs pitch their product below uh, the ideal price point, and then they find that you know if they want to increase it over time, it's going to be quite hard uh, without pissing off a lot of people. So pricing is something very important to get right. Um, it's not something you should guess either. Although I did my own product. I just looked at other competitive, uh, other competitors. I looked at basically the kind of market that I'm serving. And I asked myself, you know, this is the market that I'm serving. They are mostly solo entrepreneurs. They are aspiring um, influencers. They're uh, affiliate marketers. Um, these are basically individuals who are trying to start business. Basically. So they are aspiring entrepreneurs. So um, are they going to have hundreds of dollars a month, like a large enterprise? Um, even something like a hundred dollars a month, you know, it's going to be quite a hard sell for these people for a lot of them. You're going to be missing out a lot of, uh, potential customers. If you charge it like, for example, at a hundred dollars a month, although there are, you know, who starts at $75 a month, for example, there are products out there in the States that charge a high amount. Um, but you have to know what niche you're targeting and, um, you have to know what their willingness to pay is basically. And if you think that you have a number in mind, um, I would always 
encourage entrepreneurs to pitch it slightly higher than what you want to charge. So if, if you think that they want to pay 15 a month, make it an even 20. You know, just make it slightly higher, make it even 20. A lot of entrepreneurs are very scared because they think that if they price their products a little too high, they're not going to get customers. Because when you have zero customers, you are super desperate. You're like a guy who's a virgin, you know, like you're like, fuck, fuck, fuck that fat girl, you know. <laughs> it's, it's better than masturbating myself, you know. So when you're an entrepreneur and you've been struggling and say you have an ideal price in mind, but you dare not charge it because, you know, you've been marketing your product for three months, you couldn't even get someone to, you know, become a beta user, let alone take out the credit card. Like if you're already having trouble signing up beta users, you're like, okay, fine, I'm going to pay my product at $5 a month, for example. So I've actually seen like even uh, competitors to my product. Like I've seen some new competitors and they're like, you're charging like $10. I've seen one that starts at $5 a month. I'm like, you know what? This is not a sustainable business. I don't care where you're operating from. That is not a sustainable business. But I see a lot of entrepreneurs do that because they're very scared that um, nobody's going to buy the product. So they start off low. And I think that's the problem because if you start off low, uh, you're going to have to increase it eventually if you want to survive and thrive. And you're going to have to figure out how to do that gracefully without pissing people off. So if you're going to increase price as you go along, you can grandfather all the existing customers, which basically means that, you know what, they're going to pay the old price forever. Mm -hmm. You can do that, but there's a reason why you increase your price. You increase your price because you want to increase your growth. And if you let a large number of customers stay on the old price plan, it is as if you never increase your price at all, really. I mean, you're not, it's a half measure. You're not moving the needle. So conversely, you could increase the price on everyone. But uh, that is it can be disastrous if you're not doing it properly, because people feel deceived. You know, people sign up at a certain price; they expect you know that price to be honored, and then you know a few months later you increase your price. You know, that's gonna piss a lot of people off. So a lot of people are gonna cancel. A lot of people are gonna turn because they feel deceived. They feel like you've lied to them. The other thing is that you know they could just flat out not be able to afford it. You know, not everyone's rich. Not everyone has disposable income. Or maybe that's just going beyond the willingness to invest for this particular uh, software. So you're going to have to take a gamble and make sure that even after accounting for all the cancellations, uh, your revenue is still higher than before. So you can't really know for sure. The only way to find out is to actually just pull the trigger, see what happens. If you're confident, if you think that you know you have your your brand is strong, you have great customer loyalty. Um, and you think it's just going to be like a short term, you know, people are just going to, nobody's going to be happy whenever you increase your price. There's bound to be people who are unhappy when you increase your prices. But if you think it's just going to be like a short term emotional reaction and eventually, you know, people are going to get on your program, then I think, you know, that's something that you should do. But obviously, ideally, you should start with a higher price point. If, if I were to start Zappo all over again, um, I would just start at $20 a month. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that some software companies they just price themselves way too low in the beginning, and then when they raise their price, it's like they attracted customers who were very price sensitive because you know that's why they're using a software that costs like three, five bucks a month. Yes. And for those customers, like going from five to seven or even ten is like a deal breaker. So then yes. you're stuck serving this like lower income market you could say you know pricing is a huge component of positioning you know it's a huge component of branding as well that's why you know certain brands like gucci you know they will never be caught dead selling a handbag for like 500 dollars. no way man it's gonna cost five thousand dollars you don't care if nobody buys it you know they're gonna sell it at the price that they want to sell it because that you know that is the the brand uh, that is the message that they want to convey that is you know um basically they want to put themselves in the top tier uh, in their product category. And pricing is one of the most effective ways of doing that. Yeah. It was this, in uh, a way, this is the circular, and the, what do you call it? The chicken and egg problem, isn't it? Where firstly, someone starting out a startup has no money, like they're beggar, you could say, yes. and they have no customers. So yes. <laughs> they got a price low, but then pricing low has its own issues. Yes, it's, it's, and it's very hard. That's why I say entrepreneurship is very hard. That's why I talk about the whole mental strength thing because 
Um, when when you're trying to basically you're trying to replace your job, right? When every entrepreneur, the first milestone I would say is the first dollar you make. That's when you know, okay, shit. At least there's one person in this entire world who wants to pay for my product. The next milestone that an entrepreneur hits is that you know what? I don't have to work my day job anymore. This pays for my living expenses. This pays for my savings. This pays for my investments. This pays for everything. This pays for taxes. This pays for everything. You know what? I'm self-sufficient already. So that's the next milestone that entrepreneurs hit. And getting from the first dollar, sometimes even getting from zero to one, it's a bit tough. You know, it really depends on where you're starting. Um, you know, if you don't know how to code, you you know you suck at reading the markets. Uh, even from zero to one dollar, it might take months, years. No hey, for me, like for like, if you take Life Path Money, for example, it took me like a couple of months to get from zero to one. And it was only 13 months later when I released Live Intentionally that I started seeing some real cash flow. And I was doing yeah. it as a hobby. So for me, it wasn't like a big deal. But for someone who needs the money, it can it can get crazy. Like you might have a year or so of just development where you're not making any money. Yeah, which is or, why I... Most bootstrappers, most bootstrapping entrepreneurs, they don't make it because it's either that they are super distracted by their day job, or if they don't, like if they quit their job and they they say they're gonna burn their savings while they build a startup, um, they could never focus on their startup anyway because their runway is way too short. Usually they say, oh, you know what, um, I'm gonna, I have six months living expenses. You know what, I'm gonna try and make it a go. But that's not how it works. If you have six months living expenses. If you're three months in and you're not where you want to be, you start panicking already. You'll be like, holy shit. In another three months, what if nothing happens, you know? I'm going to be homeless, basically. So, like, if you burn two, three months of your savings and you realize nothing's happening, you start worrying about the money thing again. And there's a lot of research that shows you that um, poverty or struggling with financial issues actually reduces your IQ by two standard deviations. So That's 30 points, really? That's insane. Yeah, when poverty alone, like just worrying about financial issues, it reduces your IQ by two standard deviations. So you can look that up. Um, so you're not going to be doing your best work anyway. You think that, you know what, if you jump off a cliff and you do a parachute on your way down, you're going to, you know, survive. Kansas are, you're not going to. Kansas are, you're just going to be like super stressed by like two months, three months in because nothing's happening. Um, and then you're just going to look for another job again. And then it's going to be a job that you don't like. Um, I, I, I can say this because I actually speak from experience. You know, I've tried this myself. I know how hard it is to try to bootstrap either with a day job or with savings. Both of them are super hard and none of them are like even close right now. Which is why when the COVID lockdown happened and they started giving out free money for no reason, that was like the perfect opportunity for me. Like without that, I doubt I can bootstrap like my both like profitability. Like to create some real cash flows, yeah, I, it's not, it's not possible unless, you know, I'm living with my parents or something and they're like paying for everything. But other than that, I don't see it happening, especially since I live in, I live in Los Angeles. It's really expensive. Yes, like probably like the second or third most expensive city in America. You know, the cost of living is just, it's just outrageous. So, so why you know, do you live there? And I mean uh, this like. As a matter of fact, like, why do you live there? Like, why don't you move to something like India or the Philippines or whatever, you know, mm. where you can still live freely and not have to worry about extreme costs? Okay. Yeah. Well, the first thing is I, I can't get out of the United States for now. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that I started living, when I moved to America at first, I, I actually wanted to, you know, experience all of America. So I, mm -hmm. I had like a lot of like dreams I wanted to pursue or whatever. So I came to LA because I wanted to uh, be a Hollywood actor. So I did a lot of auditions when I was like in my mid twenties, for example. That's why I didn't start my next startup until like late 2019. So in between I was doing a lot of uh, screen work. I was doing uh, film work um, that, and that's why I was in Los Angeles. But after a while, you know, I, my friends are here. Um, I have my network here. And I like I really like the weather here. Uh, there's you never run out of things to do uh, in an exciting city like Los Angeles. So I can move to like a way cheaper place. Like I can move to like up, up nowhere, Mississippi, for example. It's like two or three times cheaper than Los Angeles. Um, but then I ask myself, you know what? What kind of quality of life will I have over there? You know. But 
that's, that's the other thing. If I really have to, like, because my revenues are not where they need to be yet, I'm going to move in a heartbeat. You know, that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make for my startup. But uh, luckily, you know, like the U.S. government, you know, helped me to bootstrap my startup. I was like, after they cut off the uh, unemployment and the stimulus stuff, you know, I already had more than enough revenue to keep me afloat. So I didn't need to move. I'm glad COVID worked out for you. Like anyone who was running an internet business just 10x instantly. They were like making three times as much money. And yes. every month was like a Black Friday month. I remember those days. That was amazing. Yes. Like 2020, even 2021, uh, it, we were doing very well. I mean, I, there's no we. Um, was doing very well. Um, this year, I, I started seeing some cancellations and I started talking to some of them and you know, some of them just straight up say, like, you know, money's tight. You know, I'm like, okay. Well, I mean, what can I say, right? You know, it happens. When, uh, you know, when the media is talking about recession, you know, continued inflation, stagflation, people get worried, you know. So people start cutting back on things that they don't think they need. People start running through their credit card statements more closely than before. You know, one thing that SaaS, a lot of SaaS companies don't like to admit is that you know, a lot of the revenue also comes from non-using, non-active users. Yeah. You know like the I mean? automatic charge. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, it's just a, a well-known secret, I guess, you know. Like, if the, the the idea is that if if you're paying month after month after month, um, you want to... You don't realize keep, it. You want to keep as quiet as possible. You don't want to, like, contact them too much to remind them. <laughs> don't laugh. Don't laugh. This, is, this, is, this is something that crosses every SaaS uh, founder's mind. I mean, I mean, a SaaS founder who's going to say like, you know what? I realized this user wasn't using for like two months. So I like actively cancel his account for him. I'm like, I mean, I guess there are some people who do that, but they're not the majority. The majority are just going to rationalize it to themselves. Like, Hey, who knows? Maybe they're just keeping it around just in case they might want to use it one day. You know, who am I to say that? You know, who am I to say how they want to use my product? You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, between you I and know, it's me, funny. it's not it's not funny because even large companies they do shady things like for example, Amazon, billion dollar, trillion dollar company. Try to cancel Amazon Prime on Amazon.com. There's like a 10 step process before they finally say, Yes, I want to cancel. The button appears. First, they're going to be like, okay, you know what? Why not um, stay with us, but we'll charge you instead of like $12.99 a month, we're going to charge you $10.99 a month. They're going to, if you say no thanks, they're going to be like, okay, fine. Um, what could have you done better though? What's wrong with Prime? And then you have to go through a survey process, you know, and you just say no thanks. And then they're going to be like, okay, we've canceled it for now, but you know what? Um, if you change your mind, you should, you know, it's like a whole convoluted process, and it doesn't need to be that way. It could just be like one quick cancel, done, you know? But they know that if they do that, um, especially at scale, they're going to lose a lot more users uh, than they're losing right now. So it's it's not just small companies that do that. It's, it's big companies. So, hey, I know what you're talking about, man. There are some software subscriptions that I used to use where that when I wanted to cancel, I couldn't find the cancel button for my life. I had to ask support, okay? How do I actually cancel this? And they're like, okay, go here, click this, click this, click this. And it's in like the weirdest place ever, okay? It's not right. in the settings. It's in like the edit your profile. And edit your profile will have something like edit your billing settings. Right. And edit auto renewal. And then you have to like type cancel manually. Right. And, you know, this one is like, as a SaaS founder, you know that that kind of thing makes a difference to your turn rate. It does. That's why so many, big, even big companies, they do this. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's a bit shady, you could say. Like, if you put it in a place where it really doesn't belong, you can't even put the blame on the customer anymore, you know? If you put it in a place where it belongs, like, if it's on the billing page, and maybe it's at the bottom of the billing page, I mean, can people accuse you of hiding it? I guess. But at least you have some argument to say that, you know what, it's, you know, the billing option is very clear and it's very clear that cancellation is related to billing if you get on the billing page if you explore the entire billing page you should see the cancellation button um then i don't you know it's a very gray area i think it's a gray area 
I don't think it's unethical to charge people who are not using it. Like it's their responsibility to cancel it, and if they don't, then that's their problem, you know. Yeah, I feel like uh, like I I subscribe to Netflix. I probably touch Netflix like once a month. Um, but I would be pissed off if Netflix just cancels my. <laughs> One day I want to watch it and I don't have it, you know, and I have to go through the entire sign up process again. I'd be pissed. You know what I mean? Like imagine having health insurance and like you didn't get sick for two months. Yeah. And like what? <laughs> oh, you cancel it. We cancel it for you because you never made a claim with us for like ten years, and we decided you were inactive. Like what? No, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, back to the thing. Uh, sometimes, you know, you gotta have to play the game, and sometimes people think that it's unethical. But some, it really depends on your moral compass. Some people think that trying to hide from your customers, like if you send out, like sometimes you're sending out promotional emails, sometimes you're sending out updates about like new features and all that. And I know of SaaS founders, like I, I talk with them, they say like, you know what? I try to exclude all the paid customers because you are already paying me money. You are already where I want you to be. The last thing I want for you to do is like realize that holy shit, wait a second, am I still paying for this? And then you can fuck <laughs> it. So you send that stuff mainly to the people whose email that you have captured before, but you have to convert them. So either they are like signing up for your newsletter on your corporate blog, or they are like trial users who have canceled and uh, decided not to upgrade, or they are like users who once paid you before, but they have turned. So these are the people you want to send your marketing materials to because they have not converted yet or they have already converted, but they have turned so they can convert again. So when you're sending your marketing material, why would you send it to all your existing customers? It makes no sense. I agree with that, actually. That as a customer, like I've bought ebooks sometimes and so, what happens is that sometimes I'll buy an ebook and then I'll get emails from the author, like pitching me the ebook, like you know, so like a long sales page or some newsletter, and then say buy my ebook. Right, like, I already you're... bought it. Like that's how you're contacting yeah. me. Why yeah. ask me to buy it again? Like what would I do with two copies of the ebook? So it yeah. doesn't make sense. So yeah, um, like for example, like I said, it's it's again a issue of morality. Like people think that hiding from your paying customers is a bit shady. Um, I think it's okay, I guess. Um, because when you sign up for a service, uh, the onus is really on you to make sure that you know you cancel the services that you don't want to do, that you want that you don't want to use anymore. Um, obviously, the onus is on the SaaS provider to make sure that cancellation is simple, it's easy, and uh, it's doable from a back end. You don't have to write in for an email or make make you know make people call someone so that you can make another sales pitch on the phone. Yeah, that one's really shady. Yeah, that is way too crazy. Yeah, All but in America, way. you know, anything goes. There are some gyms <laughs> where you have to physically be in the gym to, like, cancel your account. Otherwise, they keep charging your account. So there are some people who, like, move to, like, 10 states away. They're like, how can I physically be in that branch? I'm, like, 10 states away. I'm not going to buy a plane ticket just to go there to cancel it. So I demand that you cancel it. And then they go, like, oh, please refer to clause A, you know, bracket one of, the contract that you sign, it says that cancellation has to be in person, blah, blah, blah. So at, at the end of the day, they have to cancel the entire credit card. You know what I mean? Ah, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's essentially like, you know, gaming the customer, like what the gyms are doing. It's like, it's like a small scam. <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, you just have to read the fine print, I guess. So that's why I say like, it's a matter of a moral compass. Yeah, but see, that's like, you know, like, Jay, you bought an iPhone and then you just like, you know, accept all terms and conditions. And in the terms and conditions, it says like, we now own your kidneys or something like, and then Apple goes like, refer to like term 5C, like you have agreed to give us a kidneys. That is not how (laughs) we do it. Yeah, I know. I know. That's why uh, I always advise people, you know, just, uh, be careful, you know, be careful in, in the world, in, in the world of business. A lot of shady people, a lot of shady sellers, a lot of shady buyers too, you know, you know, it's just shady all around, you know, business uh, can be pretty cutthroat, you know, you got to look out for yourself. Going back to what you were saying earlier, though, like when you started your first business, you were 23 years old and yes. you found that you were distracted by a lot of desires of 23 years old that is you wanted to party yes. you wanted to hit on girls etc etc yes. just for around the sun yes. but what is the right time or what how, when do you actually start a business because this is a lot like having a baby you know once you have it you have it and then you got to deal with it 
two kinds of right. and and baby, like baby yeah. analogy because I like the baby analogy because there are arguments for both sides. There are arguments for like having a baby at like 21. There's also arguments for having a baby at like 30. So I can really see both sides of the argument and it applies to business as well. I mean, if you start a business at 21 and you just focus on your business, that's perfect. Um, you'll most likely succeed because you're young, you're energetic and over a long enough uh, uh, time span, if you don't give up, you will succeed. This is just how business works. Nobody fails forever, unless you're really, unless you're really dumb, then, you know, but you know, if you persevere more likely than not, you're going to be successful. So by 30 years old, you're going to be successful. You're going to probably be a millionaire. You probably, you know, you probably have one exit under your belt, you know, probably own a house, but the trade off is that the trade off is that you're going to be inexperienced with women. You probably um, have to forego a lot of friendships, a lot of happy times with your friends and family, which you know you can never replicate because trying to make friends when you're 30 and 40 it's very different from you know making friends in your 20s and your teens. Like people are a lot more fun when they're young. Basically, um, you're gonna miss out a lot of traveling, maybe opportunities, maybe that's a maybe. You're not too busy working. Um, yeah, so you're gonna miss out on the opportunity on really trying out the careers that you truly, truly want. Like, if you want to be a rock star, you want to start a band, you want to travel the country, you want to travel the world, you know, performing in bars and clubs and you know venues and all that. Say you have a dream, you want to be an author and all that. Um, starting a business is typically not one of those, like dreams that people have when they were a kid i mean it can be and if if that is your dream i mean more power to you you built two birds with one stone and that is perfect but if starting your, a business is just a means to an end to you because you want to increase your standard of living you want to increase your quality of life you want more freedom then i feel like for me and i don't regret what i did which is that i rationalized to myself that i have the rest of my life to work hard but I'm only 25 years old once. So I'm gonna do all the things that I wanna do. I had like a phenomenal 20s. Like I lived my 20s the exact way I wanted. I did so many things. I went in so many places. I dated so many girls, you know, I went to so many clubs. I tried so many different career paths. Um, I've met so many people, done so many things. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way. Like for me, I wanted to get all the fun stuff out of my system first. And this is highly individual because when I went to prison, like it completely rewired my brain. It reminded me that whatever I have right now, it could just be taken away in an instant. Like you don't even have to particularly do anything wrong or, you know, you can just whatever's yours right away, just yank it from the bottom. So, you know, Buddha once said that the biggest mistake that most people make is thinking that they have time. And I, mm. I strongly subscribe to that. I strongly subscribe to that because I believe that just like in the financial markets, you have to take profit often and you have to take profit early. And it's the same with like um, life. I feel like when you're young, you should do the things that require you or that is conducive uh, with you. So I realized that, you know what? There are all these things I wanted to do in my heart. I'm not gonna put it all the way to the end when I'm like, oh, when I'm 45 and I'm finally retired, I'm gonna start picking off my bucket list one by one. I'm like, screw that. How do I know I'm gonna make it to 45? You know, I never know. Like I could die next year for all I know. So. Most people do have that concept in their mind, but I'm like especially insecure about that possibility. So I want to hedge against like an early death by being happy as early as possible, as much as possible. So, which is why I lived my 20s just basically just like having a shit ton of fun. And I really don't regret it because I told myself, you know what, you want to make money? 
you have your your entire 30s and 40s to do it. And like looking back, I wouldn't have spent my 20s any other way. But then again, that's my personal take. Like it's a it is highly an analogous to having a baby. There are arguments on both sides. Like you know, if you have a baby early, you know, by the time you're in your mid 30s, you're all set. You know what I mean? Um, but you would have sacrificed all the basic experiences of adolescence because you're, you know, while people are going out to clubs, people are traveling, going on road trips, they're making memories with their friends, they're dating, they're like, you know, if hookup culture is a thing, you know, they're hooking up, they're, you know, doing all these amazing things, they're exploring their careers, you're stuck at home taking care of your baby, like nine times out of ten. So it's a trade-off. And you really have to ask yourself, what is more important? Is fulfilling your heart's desires more important or starting a successful business? And if starting a successful business is the only desire that you have, then perfect. You've killed two birds with one stone. But that's not most people. For most people, a business is really just a glorified job. It's a means to an end. They just want greater control of your time and uh, freedom so that they can do the things that they really want to do, whether it's spend time with family, some of them have hobbies they want to do, you know, they like bike riding or surfing or woodworking, whatever the hell it is that people do. So you just have to do some soul searching. Ask yourself, which is more important? Ask yourself if you die at 30, which would you prefer? That you would have done all the things that you wanted to do on your bucket list so that you have no regrets, but you have no successful business? Or you have a successful business when you die at 30, but you haven't even skimmed the surface of all the things that you truly want to do. So that's the question you have to ask yourself. Because if I ask myself, if I die right now, how happy would I be with the life that I've lived thus far? I would say like 80%, like a solid 80%. Like if I died right now, I'd be like, I had a phenomenal one. I could die right now. I'm happy. So very few like entrepreneurs can actually say that because while they might be very financially successful, there are a lot of things that they haven't done because they have sort of like postponed it. it they, they see it as like a worthy sacrifice because they want to start a successful business. And they might be correct. And that is really up to the individual to decide. You know, I can pitch in a bit here because I started my business when I was 21. And uh, like I go, I started an affiliate marketing company and that was when I was 21. And that is after like three, four years of working. So I started working maybe when I was 17 and I was working in accounting and auditing. And uh, I think culture plays a big role because, for example, like in the West, like you are used to dating and, you know, you your culture kind of promotes... I don't mean to. I don't mean this in a negative way, but like a, a somewhat more hedonistic lifestyle, I would say. Yeah. And that I kind of it. like, the, for example, my grandfather never even desired dating because he didn't know what it was. Like in his mind, he didn't think of having road trips because he didn't even have a car. Neither did his father. Neither did his father. Neither did his father. And you go back in time, like across humanity. Not a single person in my generation of like, you know, you know what he called it, like my, my genes was dating or like driving in cars or traveling Europe or whatever. So I don't need it. Like, you know what I mean? Like it isn't necessary for me whatsoever. Like my gene generation, like they were happy for like millions of years or however long they existed without these experiences. And I, I will say that cultural impacts do play a role. For example, Someone who lives in the West or grew up in the West would probably consider, say, not having too many experiences like that to be like a boring life or like a not as happy life. But someone in the Eastern part of the world, it's like a normal thing. Like, I don't care. So for me, I would say like it was more of like I was more focused on the business from day one. I will say that for people who do want to have more fun while doing a business earlier, don't get into a serious relationship because that you don't want to get into emotional commitments because your main emotional commitment needs to be a business. So if you get into a serious relationship, then you're talking to the girl, you're thinking of her, you are going out with her, etc., etc. All that costs way too much time. 
Yeah. So you need like low commitment fun. Like if you want to go trekking, go trekking for like a day or two, come back, and then you can work on your business. Versus, fact, the, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. In fact, I would say for most men, even if you're not starting a business, you shouldn't get into a committed relationship. Like, I agree with that to an extent, but it depends on like where you are. Like if you're in the West, then definitely like you shouldn't get married at like in your early twenties in the West. But in the east, it's not that it's bad of a deal, you know. But, yeah. no, I'm saying in the west, I don't think you should get married at all, whatever the age. Because yeah, in the west, I wouldn't get married. Like it's like getting out of it. You you have an exit option, right? If you don't get married, like okay, if 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 this girl is like going to change her behavior, whatever, I can leave. And western girls tend to be very volatile. There, they have since the culture is broken down somewhat. You could say like they don't get married as much. Divorce is more common. Oh, the culture is broken down completely. Yeah, so in the West, it doesn't make yeah. sense to marry, but in the East, it's not that big of a deal. Like you don't have too much to worry about sense. as long as you were like smart. Yeah, before I came to America, um, like divorced parents, single parent households, um, they're unheard of. Like every single kid I went to school with, two parents, you know, they're all together, you know, they're all married, they're not divorced, you know. But when I came to America and I started making a lot of new friends, I was shocked that the norm, the norm, the majority, either the parents are separated, the parents are divorced, uh, they are, they have like stepdad, stepmoms, you know, some of them have like two stepdads, two stepmoms, you know, stuff like that. You know, where I came from, it's unheard of. Like, it's shocking to me that like how normal it is. Like to find someone, um, you know, who, who has like a, you know, perfect family, their parents are still married, they're still together. Uh, I think they're in the minority. So when you say the culture has broken down somewhat, the culture has really broken down, I would say, you know, marriage in, in the West is a huge risk. And for me, you know, if you own, especially if you own a business, you have to see it through a business lens. It's like someone coming in, because marriage is socialism, but with you. So basically my pot of money your pot of money. Let's mix it together in this one big pot and let's divide by two. That's essentially what it is. So if you are bringing the lion's share of money and she's bringing in relatively little, that is something that you have to uh, be aware of. You're literally putting up 90% of the capital and then you only get 50% of the equity. Like if this was an investment deal, you would be like, screw this. I'm not going to make this stupid deal. This is ridiculous. But when you introduce feelings and all the abstract, intangible things like love and sentimentality and affection and intimacy and all that, that's when guys, you know, they start taking off their business hat, they're putting on their, uh, you know, their, their, their provider, beta provider hat. You know what I mean? And that's very dangerous because um, marriage is a legal and financial uh, contract, first and foremost. You can say, that it has roots in like religious, um, whatever, it has a religious origin. But in 2022, the reality is that um, it's an invitation for the government to meddle in your financial business when you want to separate. Yeah, moreover, I would say that, like, if you look at court judgment, it doesn't really work out for men when marriages break down, you know, like, it's like, the woman profits, like they get paid to Absolutely. divorce and you pay to divorce and you lose like three, four years of your life doing this nonsense. It's like, uh, sometimes in you the West, I would not get married. More because of child support and alimony. Yeah, it's, it's like having a liability, you know, it's like you got to keep paying this woman you don't even, aren't even yeah. married that, to, you're not uh, even sleeping so with. Really so, for example, in California, child support is based on the amount of time that you spend with the child. So if you spend Less time with child, you have to pay more in child support. So what some women do, or at least what some of their divorce attorneys advise these women to do, is to accuse the husband of domestic abuse. Because once you accuse them of the domestic abuse, you can have a restraining order, and then you will lose access to his kids completely. So which means now he spent a total of zero hours with his kid. So now he's liable for the maximum amount of child support. So this is how the system works. But the family court doesn't care if the... Uh, Okay, the accusation is real or fake. They don't care. All they know is that there is a restraining order. You know, so the system is completely biased. 
completely rigged. It's corrupt. Yeah, it's a trap. That that sucks. That's stupid. Yeah, shouldn't get married in the West. Like, here's my advice to all the listeners: if you are a Westerner, if you're an American, and you get married, this is a lot like jumping off a cliff. And you know, like you've been told it's a bottomless pit, so you can't like splat, but you just never know. Yeah, and with marriage, uh, like you know, the divorce rate is fifty percent, and eight percent of divorces are initiated by women. So you can see, you can sort of see like the incentive structures right there. Why are the vast majority of people who initiate divorce women? Because they stand the most to gain, and the men. Uh, send the most to lose, and, and it's not just that. It's not just a money thing. But once you get married with someone, it's um, they lose all incentive to behave well. Basically, you know what I mean. Like, what are you gonna do? Divorce me? Divorce me and pay me half of your assets? Yeah, let's do it. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. like, you literally have yeah. no leverage because what are you gonna do? You, you can't hit her, and you shouldn't be able to hit her anyway. Um, you can't just evacuate her from your house. You can't do that. Domestic violence. Um, you can't, um, you know, you can't nag her to change because why does she have to change? She doesn't have to change. So your only option to get out of, of, of like a terrible situation is to divorce her. And that means um, you're going to have to pay alimony. You have to pay child support. You have to uh, give half the house. You'll probably lose the house to her, uh, the car, whatever other assets that you have, your 401k, uh, you know, all the other stuff, stock. Uh, bonds, whatever you own, like crypto, whatever. That's crazy. So when you take the sentimentality out of it, most men do realize that marriage is a very, very bad financial decision. The only exception I would make is if you are marrying into money. So if you are like marrying into a really prominent uh, family with money, with name recognition, you know, there's a, a certain reputation of prestige that you can benefit from. Or if they're famous and they're successful, like for example, um, the husbands, ex-husbands of Adele and Kelly Clarkson, they did very well for themselves. You know, they were nobodies, and then they walked away with like, you know, millions of dollars in divorce settlement. I wouldn't say that they made a bad decision marrying. You know what I mean? Because they married intelligently. They married like a businessman. They married like how women marry, basically. Yeah, women are really smart about this. Men need yeah, to learn this incredibly from women. Incredibly intelligent. Men are dumb as shit when it comes to this. Like when it comes to this thing, like women are like super clear thinkers. They're like mercenaries, you know. They can put on their business brain. They can put all love and sentiment, sentimentality and feelings aside. They they just think very pragmatically. Do I have a financial future with this man right here? Because if I don't. It doesn't matter how hot, how nice, how kind, how funny he is. It doesn't fucking matter. Because my number one priority as a woman is my economic survival. Because eventually, I have my dreams that I want to fulfill. I want to get out of the workforce. I want to have babies. I want to be a stay-at-home mom. You know, I want to go brunch with my friends in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon. You know, I want to go to yoga lessons in the morning. You know what I mean? That's that's what most women ideally want, whether they admit it or not. So economic survival is at the forefront of their mind when they marry. Guys, I don't know what they think of. Most guys are too thirsty to think clearly. You know, they say they propose to the first girl who likes them or, you know, maybe maybe because she's cute or whatever. Because most guys, are, you know, are very like, they have this scarcity mentality, you know. They develop one-itis for the first girl you know, who's willing to be their girlfriend. You know, they think that no other girl is going to like her, like them, you know. They think that, you know, if they lose this girl right here, they're never going to find another one. So they tend to make very irrational and um, basically self-detrimental decisions when it comes to marriage. You say women are very smart when it comes to this. Men, not so much. Yeah, I've heard this saying, okay, it's something like this, okay? Men are smart in everything except in love, and women are smart in one thing, and that is love. Yes, and and I do agree. I think that is a brilliant quote. I've never heard of it, but um, I think it's a brilliant quote. And sometimes it's, to be honest, it's quite embarrassing. If we, the top three richest men on earth have been divorced: Bill Gates, divorced; Jeff Bezos, 
the board. Elon Musk the board. So Man, Elon I, Musk has like a rough thing, you know, like three or four times he's been divorced. Yeah, yeah. I mean I mean, I don't understand how some men can be so intelligent and like such killers in the business world. And then they lose to a woman at home. You know, it's very embarrassing. Like Mackenzie Bezos walked away with sixty eight billion dollars in divorce settlement. Like she's trying to give away to as many charities as possible and she's still the richest woman on earth. It's crazy. Like you cannot convince me that Jeff Bezos made a smart decision in getting married. He, he did didn't. not. He didn't. Like anything that resulted in the loss of like, you know, sixty eight billion dollars, it's not a smart well, decision. It's just not. Like it just isn't. Like And it lends credence to your quote, which is that men are smart in everything except when it comes to women. And women are, well, not the smartest men in everything, except when it comes to the opposite gender. Like, women are so smart. Like, when it comes to, like, dudes, like, women always get the upper hand. I rarely ever see dudes get the upper hand. I mean, they do, but it's very rare. Most dudes are, like, sims. They, you know, they immediately lose to women because they just have this pedestalization mindset they're like completely starstruck in the presence of women, you know, their jaw is on the floor, you know, and it's so easy for women to manipulate a man like that. And it doesn't even matter how like financially successful he is. If he doesn't have the right mindset when dealing with women, um, he's going to lose his money eventually. Uh, to women. I think it's a lot like guys who typically aren't good with women. And that's most guys for them. A woman who shows attention is like, a big deal, you know, for them. It's, yes, like... it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. That's why I say they're starstruck. They're like, oh my God, a girl showed, uh, you know, interest in me, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to worship her right now. You know, I'm going to kiss her ass, you know, suck her asshole 24 seven. That's what I'm going to do now. That's what most guys uh, do. And, and, okay. And this ties in again, to, like my whole, like, you, you got to have fun in your twenties because I believe that being good with women, knowing how to handle women is an indispensable financial skill. If you don't learn it, you just get shipped into like the marriage industrial complex, you know, you just get married because you didn't do your research and then, you know, you pop up a few kids because you didn't do your research again about family law. And, then, you know, you don't learn these lessons until you finally already made these mistakes, you know, and then at that point you're like, oh my God, it's kind of too late. So you have to learn these painful lessons, hopefully not by, you know, committing them, committing this, these mistakes yourself. But hopefully by reading the experience of, experiences of other people and go out and date as many women as possible so that you have like a really good understanding of women. You have to understand how women operate. You have to understand what women really want, how women uh, manipulate men so that you know how to guard against those manipulative tactics. And most men haven't been through these uh, these few years of like like this baptism of fire, you know, this, they haven't paid their dues with women. And then they just straight away just go and marry like their high school sweetheart. Recipe for disaster. So it's not just like, oh, you know what? I'm a hedonistic person. I can go and fuck around or whatever. But no, you got to learn how to deal with women. You know, it takes a culture to keep the, you know, marriages happen. You know, what, what for example, like in the East, let's say you could marry at 21 and not worry too much. But in the West, let's say you marry at 21 and what happens is that, let's say you have a kid and then the woman starts saying, okay, all my friends are going out and partying and having fun and I'm here raising the kid. Maybe I should get the divorce. Maybe I deserve better. This isn't the life I signed up for. All my friends aren't, they aren't married and they can have so much fun and I'm here because I'm married, so I should get divorced. So it takes a culture to keep marriages together, you could say, because otherwise... Most humans don't have the psyche to get rid of the FOMO. Yes, I agree. Um, American culture is, uh, Western culture as a whole is sort of unique in this aspect because in no other culture, you know, um, where uh, in the world where feminism actually, you know, is such a mainstream ideology, you know, Everything is, girl. Everything is, um, you have to be happy, you know, you have to do what makes you happy. And, and the, the, the government 
uh, encourages that. They enable it. Because like, if a girl wants to leave a man, what are the penalties for her? Nothing. In fact, there are actually cash and prizes, in fact, awaiting her if she wants to destroy a family. So why would she not do it? She would be surrounded by so many influencers, like her mom will tell her, you know what, this guy isn't where you want him to be, you know, uh, why don't you just divorce him and just take his money and just be on your own, you know, and then they're going to be talking to divorce attorneys who are just going to tell them, you know what, take him to the cleaners, the courts are going to be on your side, you know, her friends, her co-workers are going to tell her, you know what, I'm so happy after I divorce my husband, you know, he has to pay me alimony and child support right now, but I don't longer have to have sex with him, you know what I mean? Like, so with all these like negative influences around her, it's like, it's it's really an uphill battle for marriages to even survive in the West. And like you say, a lot of things, things are very cultural. Like the whole mindset that you have to go out and have fun and be hedonistic and even have a bucket list, uh, let alone take away all the items in your bucket list. That is a very like uniquely Western thing, I feel. Like, in the, in, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but in a country like India, like college students are not going to say like, oh, I'm going to take a couple of years off college for my gap year because I want to go, you know, backpacking in Europe. It's probably yeah, that unfair. never happens. Never. No, never, happens, one. Right? never in Asia. Like, holy shit. You want to graduate as soon as possible so that you can start making money as quickly as possible. That's the mindset. I would be really there. scared of proposing that idea to my parents if I was like, oh, high oh, that, <laughs> when you know, when I first told my mom and my dad that I that I'm taking like a a, a, a leave of absence from school, they were like, you know what? The first thing wasn't like, are you okay? Are you struggling with school? Like, no. They got pissed. We got it like a <laughs> fight right away. They don't give a damn about like, oh, you're miserable, you're depressed, you know, like you want to do something else with your career. No, finish, get the degree so that I can tell my friends and relatives that, you know, all my children have graduated college, you know. You know what I mean? That's the whole Asian mindset, you know what I mean? In that regard, I think I get, got a bit lucky because I did drop out of college. Oh, you did? I went for a month and they were teaching us really basic stuff. And I was like, this is not a useful, like, this is not a good use of my time. And I was always, all, you know, on the side, I was doing a professional degree, which was chartered accountancy. So I didn't really need to graduate with a regular degree. Right. So I was like, screw this. I got to wake up at seven, come here and then go to my class for CA. And they aren't teaching me anything useful anyway. So right. I just left. Like we had subjects like eco-feminism. Like what is that? Like that's bullshit. Like, <laughs> like, I'm not even joking. Up. The subject was like, like, you know, Earth is like a woman, right? Like it's supposed to be like nature is a woman, and because we're like feminists, it's like you gotta take care of the Earth. It's like eco-feminism. I'm like, what the fuck am I coming here for? <laughs> <laughs> what did you sign up for, right? You're like, <laughs> and I was you're spending to your valuable <laughs> prime learning bullshit, you know. So I just dropped out. Like I wasn't having any of it. Like I was yeah. not gonna be here. And, and so I dropped was, out the same day. And that was a great decision, right? You didn't regret that decision. Man, right now I think I make more money than my entire college class of like 120 or something combined. Yeah, and that's great. That's perfect. So you 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 know you 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 know forge your own path. You know. And then but it could have turned out the other way too. I just it's it's a risk you have to be willing to take. You have, but you took risk and it paid off, and that's great, you know. Fortune favors the bold. So I would say that there are significant advantages if you are an Indian who wants to start a business. You know, in large part, the culture supports it in the sense that ah. Like for in your case, for example, you were distracted by dating women, etc. Oh, in my case, oh, that was not especially, I don't care. especially not California. Uh, California, maybe if I were in Silicon Valley, but I wasn't. I was in SoCal. I was in Los Angeles and Hollywood. And uh, this culture here is completely very unconducive for like startups. You know what I mean? But if you say <laughs> India is a very helpful environment, then you know that's perfect. Yeah, it really is. Like, for example, for me, I didn't have to worry too much about money because I was earning in US dollars. So yeah. for me, like even a small and income, you spent, I was like, you know, a, a very tiny fraction of your, your monthly income, you know. I, I spent my annual expenses less than a week's of income. So it's like two, three percent of my 
Holy in Kim is my total expense. Oh, I would and kill. I that. live a good life. I'm not a miser, you know. I like, I live a oh. good life. So in India, like we live with our family, so it's like it's there's there are like little expenses. I don't drink, I don't smoke. I have like no bad habits, you could say. So a lot of things in India kind of work out for you because the culture is this way. So people underestimate the importance of culture, but I would say it's the most important thing. I think it is important now that you mention it. Yeah. All right, Jay. I think we're two hours in. This has turned out to be one of my longer podcasts. Is there yeah. something you would like to give away to all of our younger people who want to start a SaaS company? Is there something we missed or something you want to share? Mm, no, like I say, first of all, you have to just uh, ask yourself what's more important. You know, if there's some other things that you think you want to do in life first, uh, definitely do it because you never know. Your friends are not going to be there forever with you. Um, definitely get it out of your system. That's if you're, you know, the kind of pleasure-seeking person like me. But if you're not, and you're, if you're all business, then definitely start as early as possible. Pick up all the skills that you need. Pay your dues uh, as young as possible. Um, skip college if you need to, because college gets in the way more than anything else. Don't think that you need a college degree as a safety net, because um, I feel like in 2022 the tide is turning where uh, finally a college degree um, is starting to become less useful than actually having monetizable skills on the internet. So if, if you want to quit college, if you feel like college is not for you, um, there is no better time to voluntarily drop out of college than 2022. Agreed. I think that if you can show that you have skills and you have some reviews from people you've worked with, it's like, you don't need college anymore. Yeah. Especially I mean, if you're in tech. Like especially if you're in tech. Yeah, especially if you're in tech. You know, if you have some skills, if you have marketing skills, if you have coding skills, um, any kind of skills that is in high demand, even video editing, animation, stuff like that, anything that is in high demand um in our tech based world today, you don't need college. You really don't need college. A lot of these skills you can learn online. All you need is a great attitude and a lot of perseverance. And uh, sticking to it, you know, sticking to it and, um, you know, find a market that is willing to pay you for your skills and um, do the work, you know, just put in the hours, put in the years. Um, I guarantee you five years in, 10 years in, you'll definitely be where you want to be. All right, Jay, where can people find you? Where, what should they look for? And okay, tell us uh, a bit about Zappo for people who've forgotten. Obviously, if you are interested in growing and monetizing an audience on Twitter, I would say um, definitely check out my product, Zappo.com. Um, it's a Twitter growth tool that is geared towards um, small personal brands that want to grow an audience on Twitter and sell products and make a living of it so that they can replace their day job. And you can also find me on Twitter. My handle is the Rail Jaber, J A Y B. All the links will be in the description, guys. And thank you for watching. You guys make it possible. Have a great day, and we'll see you guys soon. Thank you for having me.